Uh, so we are done in Hebrews. If you're like, we're done in Hebrews. Yes, you missed last week because of the snow, but we are done in Hebrews. So today we are going to be opening up in Isaiah 11, Isaiah 11, and we're going to be talking about the prophecy uh, of Isaiah about out of Jesse's stump, out of that root, uh, a new shoot has come, and we're going to talk about that. So if you have your scriptures today, turn to Isaiah 11. We'll start in verse 1. Probably one of the most profound prophetic books in Scripture is Isaiah. It is a heavy hitter. If you have not read Isaiah, read Isaiah thinking about all the prophetic, and then do this. Read through Isaiah, and then search at all of the prophecies fulfilled in the New Testament in Isaiah. Does that make sense? That, that were uttered by Isaiah 600 years before the birth of Christ, and, uh, and then came to pass. And so... Right here it says in 11.1, it says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From the root, a branch will bear fruit. Anyone have any other, any other translations that say it's some other way that, that adds a, a different spin? Nope. Okay. A shoot will come out from the stump of Jesse. What is this meaning, you guys? What is the shoot? Does anyone know? Jesus. And who's Jesse? David's dad. Okay. That stump, that Jesse stump, named after Jesse, was the father of David. David, whom God promised that his line and his sons and his family would reign forever without end. And when David's sons and grandsons and great-grandsons turned from God, loved the gifts in the flesh even more than the giver and the father, their kingdoms fell and their homes fell apart. It looked as if the whole family tree of Jesse had been chopped right off at the roots. Right? If you were to actually follow the line, you have all of the promises that were given to this family, but really those promises did not seem like they continued. The intertestamental period was an incredibly dark period. So as I was reading about this and I started looking at this, I, w I was like, you know, where does this idea of a stump come from? And it actually came from Isaiah 10, 33 and 34. So we're going to backtrack just because they put 11, 1 there doesn't mean they should have. Does that make sense? Okay. So, and if you go 10, 33, it says, see the Lord, the Lord almighty will lop off the boughs with great power. The lofty trees will be felled. The tall ones will be brought low. He will cut down the forest, thicket with an axe. Lebanon will fall before the mighty one. What was Lebanon? What was it? The Lebanon would have been around, it would have been a lot of the country between Israel and Judea. So whenever he's talking about the, the forest of Lebanon being dropped, that's the, that's the Israelis' forest. I mean, that was a, that was a figure, figure of speech talking about basically the heart. And if you were to think about it, anyone here ever play a game, I'm going to date myself. I didn't play very many video games, but I did play one. It was called Age of Empires. Okay, there's one of us in the room that knows what I'm talking about. Two. But the Age of Empires, you would start out in a little settlement and, and you would have little workers and, and it was, everything was black and you'd have to send them out to, to start basically scoping out the land. And, and when you found minerals, you could, you could send miners and you could build a mining camp and you'd just start building an empire. And you want to know something that I found really interesting? You want to know who always won minus cheat codes? The person with the most raw timber. Why? Because it's in everything for building. If you, want to, if you want an army, you need raw timber. If you want to build buildings, you need raw timber. If you want to build ships, you need raw timber. So here when it says that he will cut down the forest thickets with an axe, Lebanon will fall before the mighty one. You know what that just said to a people of Israel? That God was going to obliterate the ability to be powerful. David's family, Jesse's family was the patriarchal family of the empire of Israel. Obviously, we can go back to Abraham, we can do all that, but the truth was their first king that held traction was David, 
after him Solomon. And during Solomon's reign, it was a beautiful thing. But when Isaiah was writing this, the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judea was completely shattered and broken. And it says here, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, and from his roots a branch will bear fruit. <clears throat> maybe you don't understand, and maybe as a kid I didn't fully understand, but this is a direct quotation about the coming of the future king, Jesus. If you were to truly be honest, it looked like the whole family tree of Jesse had been chopped off right at the roots. But God. But our covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God vowed out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot, yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root, in which that day the heir of David's throne will be a banner of salvation to all the world. The nations will rally to him, and the land where he lives will be a glorious place. Jesus did what no one could ever do before or after. Jesus did come from the stump of Jesse. The royal authority of the house of David had lain dormant for 600 years when Jesus came as king and Messiah. When Jesus came forth, it was like a new branch coming from an apparently dead stump. And why am I talking about this? Because we're entering in, uh, our family is reading an advent right now. Some of this upper quotations actually came from an uh, Ann Voskamp uh, devotional we're doing for advent. And it's been really exciting to me to hear, and if you don't do an Advent reading with your kids, I, re I recommend, even if you don't have kids, do one. Uh, because what it does is this, it'll start you a month in advance thinking about the coming of your king. Oh, well, it's, it's I, I have no problem with that. But do we? If we were to be very honest, can I just be really honest with you guys? I, I'm going to just say what America's more excited about. America's more excited about lavish presents. You know, I, I'll be, I'm straight up, if, if, we were to, if they were to ban all presents on Christmas, I would be like, thank you, Jesus. Because you want to know what I spend a month doing before Christmas? Frantically trying to build presents. Frantically trying to buy presents. Frantically trying to figure out how we're going to budget presents. Right? And really, what's the most important aspect of this? A shoot coming out of a stump, guys. It's about the... It's about the the, the tree of Jesse, the stump of Jesse growing new fruit, you guys. This is, God is saying, you know what? I, I, I'm going to align myself back with this family that I promised, and I'm going to bring life into this world. 600 years of dormancy. Could you imagine one of the, we actually are reading two right now, a devotional and then more of a fun one. Uh, we're reading Jotham's Journey with our kids, and yesterday there was the quotation in there where there were, it was the rabbi and Nathan, and the rabbi was saying, you know what, Nathan, quit spreading these lies about the Messiah's coming. The Messiah will not come until we're perfect, and when we're perfect, then the Messiah can come. And Nathan said, no, the Messiah comes so that we may be perfect. And, and, I, and it's like, you know, whenever you start looking through kingdom-minded eyes, you start seeing kingdom everywhere, and you go, God, it isn't about us being perfect, it's about your son being perfect. It isn't about us getting enough. It's about your son being enough. And out of that stump came life. The Lord wanted Judah to know that even though the Assyrians and the others would come and bring judgment, God would still use them and bring forth life from them. Even if they're looking like a long dead stump, God can bring forth life. So one is talking about all this shoot, but let's move on. So a shoe will come out of the stump of Jesse, and from his root a branch will bear fruit. That's exciting. That's a great intro. But what I really want to chew on is verse 2 today. Because verse 2 is where the power comes. So the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. Who's him? Jesus. And guys, let's just think about this. This is 600 years prior. Well, this would probably be more in the 400-year prior range. But this is 400 years prior, about 450, 500. And we have an opportunity for half a millennial before, sorry, my brain was going through all the dates there. <laughs> half a millennia before, we get to see a prophetic word speaking about our son, our God's son, Jesus Christ, our brother. So it says, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom, of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So, 
If we were to look at verse 2 now and chew on that for a while, let's talk about the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. So let's, let's just understand a concept here because this is something that I've not understood until the last couple years. Jesus Christ was fully man, yet what? Fully God. I think we kind of get that as much as our human minds can wrap around that concept. But he is fully man, yet fully God. Did Jesus have to give anything up to come to earth for us? What? Because this is the most important part right here. Okay, he gave his life. But something more than that, before he gave his life. So Jesus Christ went from being part of the Trinity in a what realm? Heavenly spiritual realm. And he took on what? Flesh. Jesus Christ actually chose to give up who he was so he could become that which he is today. And why is that important? Because Jesus Christ actually gave something for you. Well, of course, you died on a cross. No, 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 beyond that. Beyond that. Jesus Christ actually had to give up his position and his place of God in, in that spiritual realm to become Jesus in the, in the physical realm, the Son of Man, the Son of God. So with that... Did he have the ability? Why did it say here that the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him? He is the Lord. Because he was a human. And a lot of times we think, because how many times have you ever thought, it's like, well, Jesus just doesn't really get it because he's God. There's this beautiful picture that we see whenever... Jesus was baptized in the Jordan by his cousin, and he went under, and when he came up, a spirit, the Spirit of the Lord alighted upon him like a dove, and, and the Father from the heaven said, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. He then went where? Forty days into a wilderness where he did not eat anything. He only had water to drink for 40 days, and he was tempted by the enemy. Why did the enemy tempt him? If he was fully God and it was not a big deal, why did the enemy tempt him? So we could have some good things to read about? No, because he knew he could make him fall. He thought he had a chance. Because he's like, now I got him fully as a man, so now I can come as the deceiver, and I can be the deceiver in his life, and I can make him fall, and I can make him stumble. And if he stumbles, guess what hope you have? Zero. Jesus Christ was our only hope for having right relationship with the Father. And so if Jesus would have stumbled in that wilderness that day, if he would have taken, and that's a whole other study for a whole other time, but you want to know what Jesus was offered? It wasn't women. It wasn't, it wasn't money. You know what he was offered? Kingdoms. Why, why do you offer a king kingdoms? Because it's something he wants. Yeah, he's all about it. And why did the enemy give him that? Because he knew that's what was actually going to tempt him. Side note, sorry, bunny trail. So the spirit of the Lord rested upon him. Why did it have to rest upon him? Because guess what? He was a spirit-filled man. And that makes everything way different. Because all of a sudden, guess what? Jesus dealt with all the crap you deal with. The difference is this. He never stepped out of the spirit. I made a statement a while back, and I caught flack for it, but I said this. If you walked every single day of your life spirit-led, you would never sin. Because the spirit, is, has, the spirit has no sin inside of it. The Spirit will not lead you down that road. So if you walked every single day of your life spirit-led, you would have no sin in your life. The problem is this. We really suck at getting off that bus. Right? We're like, oh, detour. I like a little flesh time now. But the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. And let's look at this now. These seven aspects of the Spirit of God are not only characteristics of the Holy Spirit, but are grouped together in a seven to show the fullness and perfection of the Holy Spirit. I love Scripture because every aspect of Scripture, if you look at it from every different direction, there's a different aspect to it. Why was there seven things spoken here? Because that was a very, very important uh, number in the Hebrew uh, in the Hebrew system, and that was a, a, a number of blessing. 
So if you were to look at this, let me just explain something. There's not seven different forms of the Holy Spirit. You need to understand that. There's one Holy Spirit. But he has, uh, so the sevenfold Spirit of God. I don't know if you guys have ever heard that concept, but that's using Revelations 1, 4, 3, 1, 4, 5, and 5, 6. Let me say it again. Revelations, if you want to study this, it's a fun study. Revelations 1, 4, 3, 1, 4, 5, and 5, 6, all in Revelations. The sevenfold Spirit of God. There aren't seven different spirits of God, but rather the Spirit of God has these seven characteristics. Okay. And he has them all in fullness and perfection. So let's real quick look at this concept. The spirit of wisdom. You want to know what I love? If you watch from the very first time when Jesus was 12 years old, who was he arguing with? Pharisees and Sadducees at 12. You want to, and they were amazed by his questions and answers. Amazing story, different time. Look at our first kingdom conference. So you can hear about Ramez and that concept, a beautiful thing Dub taught on it. But the understanding of wisdom, Jesus could see past the fakeness of the Pharisees and Sadducees. He had supernatural, spiritual wisdom. Okay, what about understanding? Let's just talk, let's break these down real quick. Understanding. Jesus Christ understood. Well, he was God. He was man. Spirit led. The Holy Spirit gave him understanding. As I'm reading these stories, as I'm reading this list, I want you to keep these things in mind. Wisdom, understanding. The Holy Spirit gave Jesus the ability to see past things. How many times did Jesus go, you know what, I perceive the thoughts. <laughs> the whole, the, the, they were whispering among themselves and Jesus hit it on the head. How many times do we see that in Scripture? All the time. Well, they were, they were basically conniving and jesus was like oh by the way I, I got that one figured out do you think jesus was surprised whenever the guard showed up in the garden probably not why because he had a supernatural spirit empowered understanding the spirit of counsel why do you think so many people came to him for advice have you ever met someone who has a spiritual ability of counsel where you're like, I really want to go talk to that person because what they say is going to lead me down a path that's not going to hurt as much as the path I'm on, right? We need those people. There are people in this place, I'm going to say there are people in this place that are called to do that. There are people already walking in it. Justin and Cody have an amazing calling on their lives for spiritual counsel. That's, what they, that's where God feels like they're pushing them in that, that direction. Uh, they're walking in it, and I'm watching people find freedom from it because of it. So Jesus Christ walked in this, what? Spiritual counsel and a power. Do you think Jesus had any power? I mean, he, he, had a, he had a sick and lame line that was pretty intense, you guys. Why? Because they knew that he possessed the power of the Almighty. What about knowledge? A spirit of knowledge. That's the understanding and knowledge. Those can come in, in two different ways. He was... He was do you want to know what one of the main reasons why no one liked him in the Pharisees and Sadducees? Is because he knew more than them and didn't fit the mold like them. If he would have fit the mold like them and been stuck up and selfish and only dealt with them, they would have been okay with him knowing everything. But the fact that he knew everything, but he would go and hang out with tax collectors and sinners, they couldn't handle. Because you know all of this, but yet you choose to mingle with those that don't. Okay, so when a rabbi will walk up, and this is something in the, in the Jewish society that's amazing. When a rabbi would come and he would say, follow me, that would have been given to the highest ranking educated uh, in young men in the, in the uh, schools. So if I were to, let's just say I'm going to use Anthony and um, James. So you two are like the cream of the crop. You're, you're the straight A students. You got 4.0s. In, in, the local, uh, in the local school, right? Sorry, Jesse, but you're not. <laughs> and your dad was a fisherman. And since you couldn't quite hack it, you're going to just be a fisherman like your daddy. Do you guys under? I'm explaining a system that was in the, in the first century time. So these two young men would have been who Jesus should have gone to because they were the cream of the crop. And instead, Jesus goes, hey, drop your nets and follow me. The calling of the disciples, we read and go, oh yeah, he just called his disciples. No, that's incredibly profound. Because he would have been considered a rabbi of the highest ranking. 
and he went out to pick his, his disciples, those that would follow in his footsteps and emulate him. And instead, of he walked right past the learned, and he walked to the fishermen that couldn't quite make it, the flunked out, and the tax collector, and the thief, and the failure. And he says, guess what? Oh, Peter, you're a zealot. I'll take you too. Right? Oh, most of you guys are too young. Everyone looks down on you because of your age. Oh, man, come along. I'll take you. Why? Because the understanding that Jesus had a knowledge just to see what they could become instead of what they already were. Let me just say right now, I am at the point right now in my life where I would rather take one individual who's never heard a thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ, hand him the word of God and say, God, anoint him with an understanding to read your word and get your word. That's going to be so much more powerful than someone who's gone through seminary and been told what to think. Is that any of my OCD people? Like, he's not in the center. <laughs> Why is that important? Because the problem is this. We will always read with the filter of our understanding. We will always read with the filter of our understanding. The moment we take our filter off and say, Holy Spirit, let me read Scripture just as Scripture's read, then all of a sudden we become incredibly powerful for the kingdom of God and incredibly detrimental to the kingdom of the enemy. Because we read that and say, you know what, I, I have the ability to do what he did. Okay, so that means I, I, I have the ability to go and heal. Let's give it a shot. Oh, you know what, you, you said that I, I'm supposed to be as he is on this earth, so that means that whenever I look into the mirror, I should be the representation of the kingdom of God. Yes, you should. Okay, then start doing it. Oh, I just don't think we have any power anymore. Really? Show me that scripture. And prophecy has ceased and all that ceased then knowledge has ceased too if we read that scripture so just if that's the one you're going to use put that one away um doesn't make any sense the seven branch lamps is going back to that seven thing real quick because i got off my bunny trail the seven branch lampstands that held the oil lamps of the tabernacle, also an illustration of the seven aspects of the spirit. The candlesticks had one stem in the center from which protruded three branches to the right and three branches to the left. Similarly, in this text, three pairs of names of the spirit are grouped around the central stem, which is the spirit of God upon him. That's our seven. You might be like, I only see six. That's what we're talking about there. The center is the beginning. The spirit of the Lord rested on him, yeah. number one. Okay, and then wisdom two, understanding three, counsel four, power five, knowledge six, fear of the Lord seven. That's the sevenfold. Shall rest upon him. Jesus lived and ministered as a man filled with the spirit of God. The wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. Jesus displayed in his ministry and it flowed out from his own deity, or not from his own deity, but from his reliance upon the spirit of the Lord who filled him. Probably the most powerful thing. Hello? Um, probably the most powerful aspect. The, the day I realized that, it can change my entire view of who God was. Let me say it again. The day I realized that, it changed my entire view of who God was. Because in that moment, I realized that Jesus Christ, and, and please hear me right, I'm not saying that he wasn't fully God, because he was. But he chose to give up that. He left that behind to become fully man. Why? Because it wouldn't work. If it, I mean, it'd be, it'd be really easy to sit there and go, yeah, you're fully God. Of course you didn't sin. And you want to know something that's very interesting. At that point, it wouldn't have been the perfect sacrifice because it could have been contested. It was the perfect sacrifice because he went through all of the crap we went through and yet was without sin. That's why when we see scriptures that say we do not have a high priest that cannot empathize with our weakness. Come on, somebody. In his own deity, Jesus would have had all these attributes from eternity. But when he emptied himself at the incarnation, he allowed the Holy Spirit to fill him as a man, being an, an, an internal example to us and a sympathizer with us. Jesus displayed the fruit of the Spirit to the utmost because he was a perfect vessel. Jesus received the Spirit without measure. That's what John 3.34 says. There seems to have been times when Jesus did operate beyond what a Spirit-filled man can do, such as when he was transfigured and when he performed some of his miracles over nature. But the truth of the matter is, we either believe all of Scripture or some of Scripture. 
You want to know why that seems so supernatural? Because you've never even thought you were possibly able to do it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stretch you. Oh, really? You can't? Yes. Yes, I think you really can. You know what? I believe that it's a situation where uh, Jesus calmed wind and waves, and he says, you can do even greater things than I. Uh, either you believe Scripture or you don't believe Scripture. Now, I also will say this, and let's, just, let's set all of the very spiritual stuff aside and say this. I believe it's a process of understanding and exercise. If you're, if you're spirit-filled, spirit-led, a lot of times why I think it started with tongues was because that's a really good door to enter through. Usually it wasn't like, oh, by the way, I'm spirit-filled now, waves be still. Why? Because that doesn't even enter into the, th the, the thought process. But this is the best part about it. I had the opportunity the other day to talk to a new believer. And he was, he, as he has been reading scripture, and he heard me preach, and he said, you know what, you told me that we can do as Jesus did on this earth. I said, absolutely. And he says, like everything? I said, yeah. And he goes, so like, if, if we really figured out how to do it, like we, we could do stuff like, like, put legs back on and stuff? And I said, yeah. And he goes, and like, stop storms from happening? And I said, yeah. And he goes, cool. I mean, and, it, and I was like, how cool is it that a new believer goes, okay, well, we'll, get, we'll have to work on that. Compared to the 50-year-old believer who's like, oh, no. God is God and I am not. You're right. God is God and, I, and you are not. But God adds you as his ambassador. So how, how cool would it be if he's like, you're the ambassador of God, but guess what? I'm not going to give you any power. I don't want you to actually show off my kingdom because people might want to be a part of it then. Or maybe we ought to show off his kingdom so that we can actually show the world that being a part of the kingdom of God is appetizing and exciting. Jesus fought all of his battles as a man filled with the Holy Spirit. Keep that in mind. So these seven characteristics describe the nature of the Spirit of the Lord. They also describe the nature of Jesus. There is no difference between Jesus and the nature of the Spirit of the Lord. When we see Jesus, we see the Father. When we see the Spirit of the Lord... At work, it should look like the ministry and the nature of Jesus. When we see you filled with the Holy Spirit, I should see what? Jesus. He's just adding you in as his hands and feet. So if the Holy Spirit can fill you and 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 you all at the same time, and every one of you has an ear to the heart of the Father and an ear to the need of the world, guess what actually starts to look like? looks like heaven coming to earth, to be completely honest with you. But it looks like the power of Jesus working in, my, in, in, in this world. And you might be like, oh, I, I don't know. I, I don't hear this in church much. This might not be really right. Uh, you want to know something? If you were to rewind 150, 200 years, you would have heard it in church. Uh, we've just processed away with our intellectual that, oh, it just must not be because we didn't see it. If I were to tell you that, uh, that there was a car that had the ability to do fill in the blank, high horsepower car, but there's a button somewhere inside that you have to push first to get all that power. Th there'd be some people who'd be just fine with sitting there and driving with three cylinders. But I guarantee Brian Rittenauer would spend the next 48 hours of his life looking for the button. <laughs> right? <laughs> because the truth is, the truth is if, if I were to say this power is available to you, but you have to learn it, you have to earn, not earn it, because it's not an earn, you have to learn. Then go learn it. Go be a part of it. You might be like, this is scary, Jeremy. It's not scary. It's quite profound, to be completely honest with you. You know, there is, as God has used me as an agent of healing in people's lives, uh, it's probably the most profound thing for building faith. You know, that day in the hospital when Gene's foot wasn't good. And Lori and I sat there and we laid hands on a foot and said, no, we don't accept this. And the doctors were like, it's not good. And the doctors were like, well, we don't know why the, heal the swelling went away in 
30 minutes. And, and we don't know why the x-rays don't show the same thing anymore. You want to know something? Maybe it, maybe it was just me, but for a little boy from Wheatland, that was a life-changing experience. As I said, God, you actually want to use me. You, you, you want to flow through me. And was that profound? No, that was normal. See the difference? It wasn't the once-in-a-lifetime miracle. That's the everyday miracle. You know what? Whenever you get the phone call to come to the, to the hospital because someone needs to talk to a pastor and you lead an 81-year-old woman to the Lord. Her granddaughter's in this room right now. I don't know if grandma's told you yet. Powerful. What, what is, that's a miracle, you guys. When a, when a lost soul finds the kingdom of God, it's a miracle. When, when a, a foot is supernaturally healed, it's a miracle. When an ankle, it doesn't even have a cast on it anymore. Come on, it's a miracle. Why? Because someone said, you know what, this is, and I'm going to, and, and, and hear me right, and I'm not doing this in any, in any way that, that I feel is wrong, but I don't see any reason why we can't insert something else in here. And what if I were to say this? The Spirit of the Lord will rest on Lori. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on Mark. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on Justin or Jesse or Sarah or Brian or any number of names in this place. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on them. The Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of power, the Spirit of knowledge, the fear of the Lord, and He will delight in the fear of the Lord. Why can't we put our name in there? There's no reason we can't. God's called us to do so. And then it goes on and it says, he will judge by what he sees with his eyes and decide by what he hears with his ears. Oh, we can't judge. You're right, we can't, but we can be fruit inspectors. Especially by the Holy Spirit. How many, I've had the Holy Spirit before been like, boom, careful. Don't, don't go there. I've had people before that have walked up to me, said something, and the Holy Spirit goes, that's a lie. My wife's really good at that one. She can tell me instantaneously they're lying. Oh, really? Yep, they are. Okay, cool. Right? Why? Because God has given us the ability through the Holy Spirit to judge. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And then it goes on into all of that. Because this is... There's two aspects of this prophecy, and that's another thing for another time. But we need to understand here, the Spirit of the Lord will rest on you. That's for today, you guys. That's not for a thousand years ago. That's not for the apostolics. That's not for, I mean, this is for, this is for every person that accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's step one. Step two is to stand and say, you know what? May the Spirit of the Lord rest upon me. Let me actually walk in power and might. Why? So you can get fame? No. So he can get fame. Maybe that's the other thing you need to understand. This isn't to make you look good. This is to make him look good. If, if something that you do makes you look good, God is going to get out of it pretty quick. Because he is a jealous God. And he, and he, even though you're his son, he's the power source. He is where it will come. Are we already that late? Okay. This is what I'm going to do. Um, we're, we're going to, we're going to wrap up the service, but I'm, I'm going to ask that because I know Mark Weir has got a sciatic nerve issue that is immobilizing him and that's not an option. This, I'm not okay with that. And then is there anyone else? He's gone. Okay. Okay. Paul has got pneumonia. Is there any others? I just, I feel like this is where it's going to have to go. Okay, don't tell me. Just, if you need prayer, you'll be up here. Okay, this is what I want you to do. If you feel called to pray for healing today, we're going to take and we're going to close in prayer. We're going to dismiss this service. Um, Kayla, would you mind grabbing a violin? Lori, would you mind grabbing some keys? And we're just going to, we're going to shut down this portion of service uh, if you feel called to stay and pray, do. If not, I would ask that you quietly leave the sanctuary and we can go and meet out there and have coffee and talk and laugh and all that. But I want, let's keep this sanctuary a place where we can sit there and say, you know what, God, the, 
the Spirit of the Lord rests upon us, and because of that, we have the ability to walk in this. Amen? God, we come and we thank you. God, you are so good at doing what you do. God, you, just, you did not send your son into this world so that we could uh, just have a, a, a bridge to heaven. That was not it at all. You came into this world with, through your son so that we could have relationship. God, that's, that's so much different. A bridge is just a bus ticket. A relationship's a lifestyle. It's a life change. So God, I just pray right now, if there's anyone in this place who doesn't know you in that way, God, that they have not accepted you as their Lord and Savior, the truth is in this moment, they are slaves. They're slaves to sin. They're slaves to their past. They're slaves to brokenness. They're slaves to anger. They're slaves to lust, all of those things. But God, in the moment where we say, I'm no longer wanting to run this path myself. I no longer want to run this road my, on my own, but I need you. In that moment, we go from slaves to sons and daughters. So God, right now in this place, if, if there's someone here, God, I pray you just start impressing upon their heart that it's time to make some things right. It's time to step aside and let you do what you do best. And that's come in and, and be our father and invite us into your family. I'm going to ask if in this moment when, when we're in an attitude of prayer and our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've never stepped into that place, I'm just going to ask that you would raise your hand. So God, as, as everyone in this place is, is a follower of you, everyone in this place knows you personally, God, I just speak right now over this place that you would fill them with your presence. God, I pray that you would take and you would move and touch and work in every one of their lives. God, like we've read, like we've seen, God, you, you took from a dead stump and you raised up a, a live shoot, God, from, from that which was considered to be gone and dead, you brought life. And God, the truth is, from what the world considered to be gone and dead, you brought life into my life too, God. And every one of us. And so God, today I pray that we would take the next step and we would say, God, anoint us, fill us with your spirit. God, we, we don't want that so we can speak in tongues and act spiritual. We need that so we can show the world who you are. We can truly represent the kingdom that we call our own. And I'm just going to, something that the Holy Spirit just gave me, and this might be for someone here. Um, being filled with the Holy Spirit, I describe it a lot like filling the tank on your vehicle. Oh, I got filled with the Spirit when I was 13 years old. Really? Well, was the first time you drove your truck the last time you ever fueled it, or have you fueled it a couple times since? Right? Being Spirit-filled is something we do every day in our quiet time. It's what we do every time when we're in the presence of God. It's, God, fill me afresh, fill me anew. Give me more, give me more, give me more. You will always get proportionally to your hunger. The, more, the hungrier you are, the more you'll get of God. If you want a little bit of God, you'll get a little bit of God. If you want a lot of God, God will give you a lot of Him. And the more you get, the more your ability to handle more. You just keep going deeper and deeper. So, in this moment... I would just ask if you are, if you need healing or you know someone who does need healing and you want to stand in for them, I would ask that you come up here and we'll just space you out. And then I would invite any person that feels called to pray. There's no qualifications. There's no just come up and let's lay hands on. Let's take authority and uh, let's see healing uh, because I don't believe it's God's design or plan that we're broken. So God, we thank you and praise you. We bless your name in this place, and we dismiss in Jesus' name, amen.